wanted to talk a little bit about um, endpoint types, uh, data pipe types, things of that nature. And this is the, I guess you can call it the payload types of, of, uh, of high-speed USB devices. <clears throat> so there's two hey, ways. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hey, real quick, I'd just like to give, uh, get, uh, read, read out loud. Um, person named Ben wanted to point out that he, it looks like he has seen some issues with Hudley IQ as an example for USB 2 compatibility, saying that the IQ requires more power than the USB 2 spec can provide. So I believe what he's saying is that while the fallback mode, you know, is true, it, it, it may not work in reality because of different <laughs> issues such as power. I don't know if you will maybe want to address that. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. Um, I do have some some information here on power delivery. Um, uh, I do usually make a passing comment that in 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 the pre power delivery days before Type C, um, yeah, USB all the USB versions had their own power specifications. Um, battery charging spec 1.2 goes up to seven and a half watts. But the point was that everybody abused those power specs. I mean, the, the laptop manufacturers, the PC vendors were only required to, to provide 500 milliamps of output current at best uh, on these ports. But it's obviously not uncommon to see one, one and a quarter amp type power demands on, on some of our devices, including cameras. And, um, you know, that's why with, it's, it's kind of up to, um, it's kind of up to the hub vendor, or in our case, if we're doing your, your extenders, that we support um, enough current out of that out of that power port um, to prop up that camera. Um, so the ways around that uh, typically is if you have the luxury of having a secondary um, USB port nearby, you can. Everybody's seen these Y cables. One's for data and power, and the other one's just to prop up the power through what's called droop sharing. So you're basically running power out of two ports at the same time to give that camera all the current it needs. Um, there are also, and, and it's also very much worth your while to check out um, the support sites for you know, updated firmware. Um, it's not uncommon for a firmware upgrade to change the behavior of, of, the, of the camera and, uh, and its um, respective power consumption rates. Um, but yeah, overloading a, a, um, a USB port is, is, isn't hard to do. Um, and a lot of our USB extenders, sometimes, you know, if we're held up against our competitors, the one thing that's secured our, 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 our deal has been that we can offer more current than, than many others. And sometimes it all comes down to power. One other quick tiering question, Tavis, is um, active cables. So uh, is there a general answer or is it more brand specific regarding whether or not an active cable uh, takes up a tier? We talk, we talk in very, very high level terms about what active cables, how they operate and what they do. Um, basically an active cable in its purest form is considered a, you know, some call, call them here uh, or call them um, redrivers. And essentially what that is, is an analog communication circuit to add gain or attenuation to the native USB signal to drive it down a long wire or, or, or a fiber in some cases. <clears throat> Typically in those products, there is, in many cases, there is not a hub entity or hub device in there. It is a, um, it's supposed to be a transparent passive medium where, you know, bits in on the left means bits out on the right, and they haven't leveraged a, a, a hub in those um, applications. So it is conceivable to find an active cable that does not occupy a tier on the USB network. Great, thanks. Okay. Okay, payload types. Um, so sending lots of information quickly over USB. The first we'd like to talk about and probably the most common uh, are called bulk transfers. So these bulk transfers exist between bulk endpoint types. And basically what we are doing in a bulk transfer is we're sending information through USB using all the available bandwidth at that time um, from one point to the next. Um, and in doing so, the rule is, is that we do not tolerate uh, corrupt data or missing packets. Um, so this makes it ideal for things like mass storage devices where we need perfect data. So there's flash drives, but also a lot of streaming cameras and audio devices, network interfaces, all these high speed things typically use bulk transfers. Now there's another way to send lots of information quickly over USB and that's called an isochronous transfer. And it too wants to use as much of that available bandwidth as possible, but rather than sending perfect data, it's more interested in deterministic packet rate, meaning that, you know, even though we don't have a synchronizing or a timing control in USB 3 and before, 
we want our packets to arrive in a predictable way. And this is very handy when you're doing streaming video and audio, where if you have a video track and an audio track, you would like the mouths moving on the screen to be in line with the audio beneath it. And isochronous transfers are an elegant way to do that and growing in popularity. So you're going to see this in, in, for instance, um, a lot of modern USB um, 3 cameras, 4K cameras are using isochronous transfers. Certainly the HDMI capture devices in a lot of these room controllers for uh, Google Meets, for instance, where you're doing um, content sharing through the conversion of HDMI or DisplayPort uh, traffic into USB, they're using isochronous devices to do that. Now the trade-offs between those two is that bulk, obviously you're going to get perfect data, data is going to move quickly, but in times where there's a lot of network congestion or other communication hardship, what ends up happening is the effective bandwidth starts to drop. You know, as it's similar to TCP IP, there is the concept of packet retry with bulk transfers. So if things are tough, there's going to be packet retry and bandwidth is going to, is going to roll off. <clears throat> with isochronous, data still moves quickly, packets are going to arrive on time, but in that same similar hardship, communication hardship, you're going to start seeing packet loss. So for video data, that could be a drop frame here and there, uh, and depending on how the product was, um, was engineered in the audio domain, it could be the odd pop and click. So packet loss can occur um, in order to ensure the timely delivery of data. We're bringing this up to you now because bulk and isochronous transfers um, have always kind of been baked into the standard. And as long as you were directly connecting device to host, you never really had to know about these types of details. Um, it was just there and supported and it worked. That was the beauty of USB, it just works. <clears throat> but when you start talking about extension, Sometimes these details matter because an extender may have a tough time dealing with the additional processing overhead associated with managing isochronous transfers. And so we start talking about isochronous transfers um, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about USB extension. So we're asking you to dive in a little bit deeper. <clears throat> Now there are um, a variety of other endpoint types. There's four actually in total in, in the USB world. We talked about isochronous and bulk already. Interrupt transfers or interrupt data pipes are, are what we see in things like HID devices in most cases, keyboards, things that, you know, any, if you're pushing a button or a joystick or something like that, it's typically an interrupt um, transfer. Now the interrupt transfers by nature, it's usually small amounts of information, but what's interesting about an interrupt transfer is that it has bounded latency. So when I'm pushing buttons on a keyboard, uh, you know, knowing that I push the, the, the A button is important, but also has to know, um, it also has to know when that button was pushed to respond quickly. So an interrupt in the USB world is not the same thing as a software interrupt. It just basically means that while the host is pulling all the devices that the guys who are, who are running interrupt transfers kind of get first shot, you know, at, at being served first. So they have a uh, a reduced amount of, of response time that they get uh, to benefit from. <clears throat> um, and then the last control pipe or um, data, a data pipe uh, is called a control pipe. The control pipe is what the host and the device uses to communicate, to set things up, to enumerate the device, to find out what the device is capable of. That's all handled over a control pipe. So during enumeration, we use control pipes to, for the host to discover the device, for the device to report back what it is, and for the host to make some decisions on what driver to load and what handle or address to give that, that device. It handle, happens over a control pipe. We're not using the control pipe for useful information. It's just for initialization and control. Now you see all these arrows here. Um, this basically is designed to imply that a, a, a pipe of useful information, whether it be ISO, interrupt, or bulk, are unidirectional in nature. So if we have a USB device plugged in and you start looking at it through our device tree viewer, you're going to see a minimum of two data pipes set up. There's going to be one pipe set up for incoming data to the USB stick, and there's a second pipe for USB data to come out of the USB stick. Now the control pipe is the only one that's bi-directional in nature. You only need one pipe and you can run communication in two directions on a control pipe. <clears throat> so a little more information about control pipes and endpoint type, endpoint types and such. Since up until this point, all the stuff was baked into the standard and we didn't need to market this information to anybody in the consumer space. Um, OEMs have not been really documenting, you know, does my camera use ISO? Does my camera use bulk? 
you know, how many interrupt endpoints are in there or what have you. They haven't been documented, do documenting it at that level and they, and they didn't have to really. But if you are doing a system and you do need to know whether or not you have isochronous or bulk transfers on a camera, for instance, <clears throat> because you want to make sure that you're compatible with your extender, this is a, a, an example of a free tool that you can download for your Windows machine to, to figure that out. USB Device Tree Viewer is a free program. It runs on Windows. And what it does is it basically pulls in a bunch of information from a variety of sources to display your entire USB um, uh, network in a very graphical form. Now for discovering whether or not you have bulk or ISO or interrupt, what you, all you need to do is, is, is find your target device in the device tree and then scroll down and do connection information for that particular device. And what we're really looking for here, you're gonna see hundreds and hundreds of line items in here. It can be a little confusing, a little overwhelming, but we're essentially doing a keyword search. We wanna see words like isochronous, bulk, interrupt. And that's normally, um, only included in the connection information here. In this particular case, I've, I've, I've decided to use a, a multi IO device on my laptop. And I can see here that I do have a variety of data pipes set up that include interrupt bulk and isochronous. Um, if I was running this through extension and I see isochronous, I might wanna make sure that my, my extender can support that isochronous transfer. Travis, we do have another uh, tier question here quick. Sure. Um, as you move down the tiers, do connections become slower and or less reliable? Uh, I, hmm. So the comment about adding additional tiers, it should not um, affect the throughput of the device, but what can often be impacted, uh, and it's kind of hard to measure, <laughs> um, is you will see a small change in latency. So as you bounce from hub to hub to hub to hub, down that chain, you're adding a little bit of latency and round trip delay. Um, inherently, the USB packet going through a deep tier structure is not less reliable through all seven tiers versus just two tiers, for instance. What may change though, depending on the software application in particular, is that if the software application running on the host has a somewhat tight, um, amount of uh, latitude with round trip delay and latency from the USB device, it may, I'm not saying it will, but it may start to have problems if the latency increases too much. And this is typically found in um, video capture type applications where it's expecting to see high speed data at a certain time frame from the time it makes an inquiry. If it doesn't get that data back within that window of time, it may fall over. That's not necessary. I wouldn't call that um, a general warning, however, typically the um, the software itself that might be sensitive to this is typically very um, focused, very niche, very proprietary in nature. I wouldn't say that that kind of, that's the kind of software we see in the in the general domain, such as our UCC clients and, and such. We see a little bit of that through maybe specialized ast 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 astronomy applications, you know, scientific research type applications, but for, for the majority of us, it's usually not a big deal. And then one more here, will this software or is there any other type of software that can help them help a user determine how many tiers are being used? Oh, it absolutely can. Um, and, uh, and if we have time at the end, please remind me, I'd, I'd be happy to fire it up on my machine to kind of show you how the tier structures work. But I can show you a little bit here on this slide. Here. Uh, it's a kind of a small little portion of it. You can see here <clears throat> that um, this Realtek USB gigabit ethernet uh, controller is sitting at the lowest most tier on my particular device tree. So let's call this, you know, tier N. The hub that it connects to is, is N minus one. And then as it goes back into the root controller, it's N minus two, right? You can start to see how things start to stack up in tiers. Now, the visualization kind of thing though, is that this can, it can turn into a tier, a, a pyramid looking type thing. So really what we all need, all we need to do is, um, is I, I tend to look at the, the, the device and I'm gonna work my way back and can start counting tiers. That's uh, typically a, an easy way to go. <clears throat> okay, that's all for now, thanks.